The sun had long set over the war, torn country of Syria as our Navy SEAL team, led by Jack, pressed on with the top secret rescue mission. The mission was already challenging, navigating through the chaotic and dangerous landscape. But little did we know that the night would bring an ambush that would change everything. As we approached our extraction point, a sudden barrage of enemy fire erupted from all sides. Catching us off guard, chaos ensued, and in the midst of the firefight, we were separated from our main group. The relentless onslaught of bullets and explosions left us cut off from communication, and the darkness swallowed us whole. We knew that our only hope for survival was to evade capture and make our way back to safety. With the enemy closing in, we moved with utmost caution, relying on our training and resourcefulness to navigate the treacherous terrain. Every rustle in the bushes, every snap of twig, set our nerves on edge. As we traversed through the thick woods, exhaustion weighed heavily on us, and desperation clung to every breath. But then, through the darkness, we spotted a faint glimmer of hope, a deserted cabin nestled among the trees. We made a unanimous decision to take refuge inside, hoping to regroup and devise a new plan. However, as we approached the cabin, our eyes widened with astonishment and uncertainty. Standing near the entrance was a colossal creature, its massive form shrouded in an otherworldly glow. The creature's body seemed insubstantial, as if one could see right through it, and its long, charcoal-colored hair flowed like tendrils in the breeze. It made no indentations on the grass beneath its feet leaving us to wonder if it was even of this world. Our training had prepared us for many things, but nothing could have readied us for this bizarre encounter. The creature's eyes, glowing a menacing red, stared at us with an eerie intelligence. Its face lacked a traditional nose, only two holes in its place, and its thick lips added to the enigmatic and unsettling visage. Standing on two legs, it towered over us, easily reaching a height of over ten feet. In the face of the unknown, our instincts took over, and without hesitation, we opened fire. The creature emitted a deafening shriek, an otherworldly sound that echoed through the woods, and it lunged at us with terrifying speed. In the chaos that ensued, two of our team members fell under the creature's powerful attack. The fight was brutal and unforgiving, but in the end, we managed to overpower the creature and take it down. As we stood panting and covered in the aftermath of the encounter, we tried to analyze the carcass. However, a sudden sense of danger overcame us. We heard the Syrian rebel voices in distance. They are on to us. So we had to move. Instinctively, we withdrew and continued our journey towards the extraction point. We knew that the Syrian rebel army was nearby, and we couldn't afford to let our guard down. Once we finally arrived at the extraction point, the gravity of what we had just faced settled upon us. We asked ourselves what kind of creature we had encountered, and if our general would believe our account of the events that had unfolded. As we huddled together, surrounded by the darkness of the night, we found comfort in each other's presence and the unwavering camaraderie that bound us together. The memory of that bizarre and terrifying encounter would stay with us forever. To live in a small town can often mean long drives to access shopping centers and entertainment venues. My ex-girlfriend, my daughter, and I decided to head to the nearest city about 25 miles away to spend a weekend browsing bookstores and enjoying a day out just like we used to do before my ex left and C-19 disrupted our lives. The drive was familiar and uneventful, taking us past the state park that we'd visited countless times before. However, on this particular day, something strange caught my eye. Hovering about a hundred feet or so above the center of the road, just above the tree line was a shiny metallic ball. Its presence was inexplicable, and I couldn't take my eyes off it as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. My focus on the mysterious object meant that I was no longer paying attention to the road, and before I knew it, the car had veered too far to the side, causing the tires to make that unmistakable brar sound as they hit the grooves on the shoulder. My ex-girlfriend, clearly alarmed, shouted Babe, urging me to correct our course and avoid an accident. I quickly straightened the car and asked her, Do you see that? She responded with a puzzled what. When I looked up again to point out the strange metallic ball, it had completely vanished. It was as if it had never been there in the first place, and I was left questioning my own perception. We continued on our journey to the city, 
but the encounter with the mysterious object weighed heavily on my mind. I replayed the incident over and over in my head, trying to understand what I had seen and why it had disappeared so suddenly. My ex-girlfriend and daughter remained skeptical, but I knew that what I had witnessed was not a figment of my imagination. To this day, I still have no explanation for the shiny metallic ball that appeared and vanished in the blink of an eye. The experience has left me with a sense of awe and curiosity, a reminder that there is always more to discover and that the world around us is filled with mysteries waiting to be explored. I'd like to start this by stating that I don't believe in the supernatural. But once, when I was 16, I was at a sleepover at a friend's house, and at about 3 a.m. I got up to get myself a cup of water. My bud was half asleep, but I asked if he wanted one, too, which he just kind of did the meme sound, too, and then turned to face away from the door in bed. I got out the door as the room was directly connected to the kitchen, grabbed two cups, and filled them. As I now had both my hands full, I tried to whisper for him to open the door as others in the house were asleep. I saw his hand crawl around the edge of the very slightly open door. The door started pulling into the room, but with closer inspection, the hand was completely blue-tinted with very yellow nails and way skinnier than hands of anyone in the house. I got into the room, not thinking too much of it. Turned out it was completely asleep, still turned away from the door. Didn't freak me out till the day after. My best friend of 16 years told me a story that I will never forget. This didn't happen directly to me, but it scared the shit out of me that I literally think about this tale once a week. This friend and I have been best buds since the first day of kindergarten. She's an atheist who has never believed in ghosts or anything paranormal. I used to tell her ghost stories all the time to try and mess with her, but she's all saints. After she moved into this house, I think her beliefs have changed a bit. She and two other roommates, and Cat, moved into this old house in North Carolina that was notorious for being spooky and haunted. Weird things would happen all of the time. For example, her roommate was sitting on her bed once, and her desktop computer mouse unplugged itself and literally flew across the room. The cat would be fine one minute, then look into a dark corner and hiss, stand on her haunches, run and hide. They would hear noises, feel they were being watched. All typical haunted house stuff. One of the creepiest parts of this story isn't actually paranormal at all. This old, old woman, whose husband later told the group she had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, would frequently come to the house and knock on the door asking to see her mother. I suppose she lived in the neighborhood and would walk to the house and the husband, still with a clear mind, would have to drive and apologetically pick up his wife and take her home. The roommates would gently tell her that no one lives there except the three of them, and she would usually leave, confused. One day my friend was home alone, sitting on the couch watching TV. The back door was located behind the couch. Because of the TV, my friend didn't hear the back door open, but she sensed someone behind her. She turned around, and that old woman was standing there calling out for her mother. My friend freaked and told the woman she had to leave and escorted her to the door. I guess the old woman stopped coming around after that. So fast forward a few months and the three roommates, two girls, one guy, decide to move out and go their separate ways, but the night before they moved out, they decided to Ouija board the place. Oh, told my friend she's an idiot for doing this, and apparently the little cup or whatever was flying around that board. Something came through. They asked it several questions. They asked if it was here alone, and it said no. They asked if it was human, and it said no. And that was that. But it gets weirder. My friend told me she'd often be driving to work or her new apartment in the same town and would just end up at the house. Like she had no control or awareness of where she was driving, she would just go there. One time she said she even knocked and tried to move back in without knowing why or where this impulse was coming from. This happened to her often. The three roommates later met up at a party and they discussed their time in the house. She told them about this weird habit she'd picked up and said they both turned white. Apparently, all three of them had been doing this, driving to the house uncontrollably and not being able to explain why. At the same party after my friend and the other girl had left, 
This random chick approached the boy roommate, having no knowledge of their past with the house. She said, I know this may sound weird, but I'm a medium. And you have three things attached to you. Do you know anyone close to you who has passed? The boy skeptically responded, yes. I lost both of my parents a few years ago. Could it be them? The medium said two of the attachments could be your parents. But that third thing is something else. That third thing is dark and it wants you back. Now, we can argue she made this up to try and frighten me, but I can promise you I know when she's lying or trying to prank me. The specificity of this story is too legit, and she'd have no reason to make this up. I'm just really glad she never asked me to sleep over while she lived there. On that day, July 17, 2017, I was relaxing at home in Santa Cruz, California, when I noticed some movement across the street from my kitchen window. It's a small side street with lots of large trees. It was hard to tell what I was seeing at first because they appeared to have some sort of camouflage, but they looked like black SWAT uniforms with small yellow lettering once I was able to get a better view. They were up in a tree, very well hidden by the leaves, and I was only really able to see them when they moved. It was apparent when they moved as opposed to the wind because only a small section of a branch would vibrate. I was startled and anxious because they were looking toward my house, and I first thought they had me under surveillance or something and couldn't understand what was going on. I watched them in the tree for at least five, ten minutes, and I was crouched low looking through a cutout in my fence. They seemed to spot me at some point and some point and some kind of faint beeping sound started, like an alarm on a radio or walkie, talkie. They then began trying to slowly and secretly climb down ropes that I could see being controlled by a man high in the tree, wearing a blue jacket. They dropped out of sight behind the neighbor across the street's fence. So this was all weird enough, but what happened next was absolutely mind-blowing. I was trying to see where they went behind the fence and noticed something very tall at the back of the driveway of their next-door neighbor. The driveway extends behind their house into the backyard. I realized I was looking at an unbelievably tall woman with very blonde, long hair. She had a sort of gray and white jumpsuit on with a strange-looking oval back covering that went around the top of her head and all the way down to her feet. It was only solid in the back and was whitish in color with a patterned border around the edge. It didn't really look like fabric, but I couldn't tell what it was. Her eyes were extremely large. She stood very still, but moved slightly, and there seemed to be a shorter humanoid shape, wearing the same color jumpsuit moving around rather wildly at her feet. But the shadow of the fence made it hard to see that part. The sunlight was good and bright, and the only obstruction was some sparse shadowing from tree leaves. Not really sure what I was looking at, I looked back to where the black wearing tree climbers had been and saw that suddenly there was now a short skin-colored something standing behind their fence. The fence is a lattice pattern, so there are a good many holes you can see through. It was too short to be seen over the top of the fence, but I could see a very large face with a deeply wrinkled forehead and eyes that almost looked like they were made of some kind of glitter. They were very large and somewhat rounder than what people usually describe as alien eyes. I could see that it was looking right at me, so not knowing what else to do, I waved at it. It then reached a hand with very long, bony fingers through the fence lattice and waved back. It waved a couple more times, stopping in between waves. I was so stunned that I had to look away and shake my head to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. When I looked back, it had stopped waving and was a little farther back from the fence. It seemed like a good entity, whatever it was. Even though I was seeing from across the street through two fences, I could see it quite well. Things somehow got even weirder after that. I decided to lie down for a minute, glancing back to where the massive woman had been, but there didn't seem to be anyone there anymore. I went up into my little loft, which has several skylights under a giant live oak tree. I stared at the tree, trying to process what I had just witnessed, when I noticed a couple of branches quivering like the ones the covert ops guys had been shaking. I expected to see more of those creepy agents, but instead strained to see a much smaller creature climbing expertly up into the high branches. It was difficult to see it clearly because it seemed to be a dusty gray-green color, much like the bark and leaves of the tree. It seemed to have textured skin, possibly scaly, and it had an angular face with teeny tiny little projections like little horns or possibly short antennae. It has a small mouth that looked full of sharp teeth. Its eyes were quite large and dark. 
It had the uh, humanoid build, but was short. I stared at this for many minutes, wondering what the hell was going on. Then I caught sight of some slight movement on other branches and saw two more of the same creatures climbing easily up the tall tree. They reached a high-up branch that was big enough to lie on. The light, once they stopped moving much, was not ideal, and it was hard to see them when they were sitting still. In the shade of the branches, it looked like an even smaller, dark green creature was working on the gray-colored one's back somehow. It looked like a massage to me. I watched until my neck was too painful from looking up to continue. When I looked back a little later, the branches were empty. This was all preceded by an unnerving experience late the night before. I got up to get water and glanced at the driveway neighbor's window. Inside, I saw an unnaturally gangly figure that was bluish, light gray. It was staring out of their window directly at me, which caught me off guard, and I let out a little shriek. I walked from the kitchen into the bathroom and looked again, seeing that its eyes followed where I was. I called my boyfriend in fear and told him what I was seeing. He was just excited while I was scared. I thought that would be the end of it when I went to bed, but the next day was even crazier. I wish I had a way to find out what was going on. There was also a very small orb darting about the branches of the oak tree, and any time it would graze a twig it would give a little shake. I've never seen a bird or bug or other flying life form move in that manner. I attest that this is all true, and I described it to the best of my knowledge. I have never seen anything like this before and really would like to know what was going on and if it is real why so many different kinds of extraterrestrials were in my neighborhood. I guess it was the summer of 2010, maybe 2011. A friend and I went to GameStop. It was during the times when video games were important in our lives and we went there for a midnight release. So I guess we picked up the game somewhere around 12 o'clock, a little after. Game stops about 20 minutes from my house in Ottawa, Alabama. My family owns 180 acres. It's on a road called Ponderosa Road. So we leave from Game Stop and we're headed home. We got a night planned of just playing the game, so we're pumped up. So you go through a hollow across the bridge, windy road, but you're heading upwards to get to our house. We're all on top of that mountain, as we call it, so there's a bit... In the road, a single lane road. I'd say it's probably ten feet wide. Well, as we're coming up the hill, I don't have my brights on. I mean, I could drive that road in the dark. I've done it before when my headlights went out, but I didn't have my brights on. I'm just making my way to the house, and we go down a dip in the road, and as we go up the next hill, I notice something in the middle of the road. I just see something white, almost as wide as you would expect a human. About as wide as a human is. The only way I know to explain it. So I hit my brakes and my light illuminates it. It was a human form, but it happened so quickly that I don't know any other way to explain it. It was way taller than a human should be. My uncle played professional baseball and he's almost seven feet tall. So is my dad. They're big wide guys and this thing would have made them, you know, look small. I couldn't even see shoulders. It was just like the bottom part of something white and human. Like... But the crazy thing was, when we saw it, as soon as I hit the brakes, it all happened so quickly. I can't tell if it had wings and threw its wings out that were larger than ten feet. How wide the road is? Larger than the road is. It literally stretched its body out. I know that sounds crazy, but almost like it was putty. That's what it was more like than wings. It just, like, got extremely wide and then skinny again and shot straight up into the air. I looked at my friend and asked him, Hey, man, did you see that? I knew he saw it. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't crazy, and he said, Yeah, I saw it. We just didn't know what to do. I mean, it was close to my driveway, so we just pulled into the house. I was like, man, what was that? He said, You know, I don't have a clue. It was just really odd. We got into the house, made sure we locked the doors, and pulled the curtains on the windows. I still don't know to this day what it could have been. I think about it from time to time, especially out working late on the railroad. It was a clear night. I mean, no fog, warm summer night. I don't understand, and you know I brought it up to the guy that was with me since then, and he still says I don't really know and I don't like to talk about it. Didn't really feel scared. It just happened so fast I didn't know what it was. I still don't know what it was. I just don't know if I'll ever know. Last summer, my boyfriend and I were camping in the 
our cheetah forest off the Winona scenic route. We drove through a gorgeous spillway to a creek site where we had set up our camp and were laying in the hammock for the night. Next thing I know, our dog is growling this deep growl I'd never heard her make, so it caught my attention. I look in the direction she's growling in, and I see this weird humanoid figure just casually walking in the woods about ten, twenty feet away from us. It's a light gray, maybe white color, seven-ish feet tall, very skinny, and has an abnormally large head. Our dog barks and catches its attention. It stops for a good twenty seconds, looks at us, then carries on its way. Needless to say, we immediately packed everything up and left. We hadn't taken anything recreational that night, though I sort of wish we had now. I don't know what I saw, but it scared the S out of me, and I'm so curious if we were the only ones to see if ever seen anything like that out there. In school, my friends taking photography class had images of this cool and creepy local abandoned hospital in the town across the river. It had the lovely nickname Killer Cobb. So like any sensible people in their twenties would do, I snuck in with my two classmates to check it out. It was one of my most surreal moments in my life. The first creepy thing was one room that looked like it had dried fruit scattered across the floor. In the next room there were plastic tubs with names, dates, and numbers on them. Each tub had organs and body parts in them in preservatives. The room with the fruit was covered in dumped out organs. All the way through the place, the power was on. It had been shut down for about a decade. Parts of the ceiling were falling in and windows were missing. It was totally Silent Hill quality. The creepiest was the holes in the wall that appeared to be blasted into it. The shatterproof glass with the wires in it had chunks blown out. Looked like someone had fired a shotgun through the place. There were areas that had splashes of what looked like dried blood near the holes and we found a stretcher that had a pool dried of blood that ran off the sides and under it. We got to the third floor, and as I am peeping through a window on a set of double doors, scoping out the halls that were dark to check for anything that might. You know, want to kill us? I saw this stick start coming out from behind the corner. Then I understood that I saw the shadow of a man holding a shotgun coming down the hall and dropped low behind the door. I ran to the others, and we noped out with a quickness. We reported the creepy possible murders and very real biohazards to the local news channel. Years later, it was torn down. Another, I was working on a painting at my school and my instructor had her kids in the building. They played and giggled running around the whole time. I heard it, but it didn't bother me. I was really into my project and time slipped by quickly. I realized at a point I was starving and looked down at my watch. Realizing it was almost 2 a.m., I couldn't believe she and the kids were still there as I walked to the door to tell them I was leaving. As I came to the door leading to the hallway, everything became completely quiet. I walked through the building to see what was up, and I was completely alone and creeped out. I peeked out the window that overlooked the parking lot. Nothing. I left and tried to not work up there by myself from that point forward. One of my friends had a similar experience. I am an outdoorsman. I am very experienced in hunting, camping, hiking, and general survival. I'm very familiar and used to wildlife, and I was charged by what I believe was a cryptid called a dogman. It charged me and my cousin. It was not a bear. A bear cannot move how it did, and it was not a normal wolf as they can't comfortably run on two legs. Whereas what charged us seemed natural at doing. I can elaborate further if you wish. This happened around June or July of 2007, I believe. I was around 17 years old and more cocky then, but still somewhat knowledgeable of the outdoors. My family used to own a cabin in northwestern Wisconsin. I basically grew up there in the summer. I knew the woods well, but at night it was wise to stay in the cabin, or at least by the bonfire by the beach, because of bears, wolves, and cougars. One of the creepiest things was if you were having a bonfire. The tree line was visible from the fire pit and beach, and at night you always felt like you were being watched from that tree line. But during the day, the woods always seemed normal. Not so creepy. That is, until this incident. So this happened somewhere between 12-14. Me and my cousin were having an airsoft battle. I was in full woodland camo, he was not. I retreated onto the ATV trail into the woods for a tactical advantage and our battle took us about 200 meters in to about a third of the way up the trail. 
We had enough at this point and were standing at the edge of a clearing on the trail talking, and he was maybe ten feet from me when I decided to mess with him. I shushed him and said we're being watched. He froze. Then I realized the woods were dead quiet, and I got spooked and started scanning the tree line and the other edge of the clearing from left to right when I saw it. Its teeth gave it away. It was panting and staring at my cousin. I don't expect you to believe me, but what I saw was a wolf as big as a black bear. At least 300 pounds, but it wasn't normal. This wolf was on two legs, crouching next to a tree with its arm grasping the tree. Grasping with a clawed hand, it had reddish-brown fur. I told my cousin that we have to go, and next thing I know he is sprinting. And I looked back at Wolfie, who had locked on and sprinted a few steps on two feet. And then I turned and ran when it looked like Wolfie was dropping to all fours. It charged us and sounded right on our asses barreling through the brush, but for whatever reason let us go when we broke out of the tree line and headed for the cabin. What stuck with me the most was the sheer size. Wolfie appeared to be nearly seven feet tall when upright and that, where it should have had front paws, it appeared to have large, clawed hands. Now, not sure how to explain it away rationally. I have heard wolves will occasionally kind of walk upright, but as far as I know, they can't sprint on two legs, nor do wolves get that big. And black bears more waddle on two legs. The closest description is silly, a werewolf or dogman. For years I lived in a little country town. My house was pretty far back in it, about 20, 30 men from the nearest small city. To get back to my house from the city, you'd need to drive down a few paved roads, them turning onto a dirt road that is just straight for about five miles, then turns into a typical winding country road. One night, I turned onto the dirt road, and after a few miles, I noticed a light on the side of the road that was still very far away. The section of the road I was on didn't have any houses, only woods, and the houses that were nearest were still about three miles down the road, plus located down their own little roads. It was completely pitch black, and something was weird about the light, like it was shaking. Like when someone is messing with you by reflecting the sun into your eyes off a shiny surface, they can't quite keep it still in your eyes, so it moves around quickly. The light stayed only pointing down the road in my direction, though. It was easy to spot, as it was right on the side of the road on a pitch-black night. As I got closer, my headlights began to light up the source of the light. It was a man walking. I'm not a racist, but I can't say the same for the town I lived in. As a result, very few African Americans lived there. I mention this because the man holding the light was African American, so it was a bit odd to see any none white person walking alongside the road, let alone this late at night. Something else was off, though. The man was wearing an aisle-fitting odd outfit of what looked like white burlap, as if he had taken a few burlap sacks, torn them up, and sewn them together. He was also holding a white paper bag with some sort of liquid covering the bottom like it had spilled in the bag. Another thing was the fact that Tis Road had virtually no walking space, and most of what was on the side of the road were ditches to move rainwater. Now even all of this isn't what spooked me. He was walking in an eerily steady pace with a dead look on his face, going the same direction I was heading. It took me probably ten seconds of staring to realize that, although he was heading away from me, his flashlight was pointing toward me. He was holding it backward in a fist, didn't even turn to look at me as I passed. I still don't have a clue how he could see to walk along the pitch-black road, why he was there, or what was in his bag, but... I sure as hell didn't stop to find out. I've spent more than my share of time alone in the woods, but one occasion definitely stands out as the creepiest thing I've experienced while no one else was around. I have a friend that has 40 acres outside of town that he has slowly converted into a subsistence farm for his family. Years ago, when he mostly only had a dozen or so chickens out there, I spent a few months living on the property in a tent while I was between seasonal work. At the time, the property was decades, neglected overgrown pasture land with a few clumps of denser woods. I had set up my tent and homestead right in the middle of the property in a small clear area between two densely wooded thickets. My friend would come by once a day to feed the animals, but other than that, there was zero chance of me seeing another human unless I left the property. I really enjoyed the solitude, and had taken to observing nature in a way that I had never really done before. 
When the incident occurred, I had been living out there for about two months, so I was well used to the sounds of nature outside my tent at night. I had gotten to the point where I wouldn't even bother to get out of the tent and look if I heard a small animal walking past my tent at night. I had even gotten used to the sound that the roof of the pump house made when wind blew hard from the southeast. My friend had been short on nails when he was building the roof over the pump, so the southeast corner wasn't nailed down, and a strong wind would cause the corner of the corrugated metal roof to peel up, and then crash down loudly when the wind stopped. It was about 200 feet away from my tent, so it had caused me to jump a bit when I first moved out there, but within a month it had just become another sound outside my tent at night. It was even sort of comforting, like some people that live in big cities say that they can't sleep without the sound of traffic outside their window. It probably helped that the sound was always paired with the sound of wind blowing through the trees. So one night, I'm tucked in my sleeping bag, starting to drift off, when I hear the shed corner come crashing down. Nothing to worry about, I probably didn't even open my eyes. But then I hear what sounds like a person mimicking the sound the shed had made right outside my tent. My blood freezes in my veins and my eyes open wide in the darkness, and I hold perfectly still. I know that my friend has already come and gone hours before. <clears throat> I'm alone on a piece of land that is large enough that there is no reason for a person to accidentally end up next to my tent in the middle of the night. After a few moments, the wind makes the shed roof crash again. And again, I heard a person mimic the crashing sound a few seconds later. I called out and asked if there was anyone there. No response. The shed roof crashed a third time, but this time there was no mimicking sound. So I'm out of my sleeping bag and out of my tent, flashlight in one hand, camp knife in the other. I shine my flashlight right where the faint crashing sound seemed to come from. Nothing. It's the edge of the woods, but the sound had been close and I can see through the brush well enough to tell that there isn't a person hiding behind the bushes and low branches. I'm looking at the ground, and none of the dead leaves look particularly disturbed. I'm trying to figure out how far someone could have moved at a slow enough pace to not make enough sound for me to hear their footsteps on the leaf litter. Answer, not very far, when the shed roof crashes again, and I hear the same fake crash sound again, right next to me where I'm 100% positive there isn't a person standing. At this point, my heart is beating a mile a minute, and I'm getting ready to believe in the supernatural. While sweeping my flashlight beam through the human-free spot, the sound seemed to be coming from... I see a bird. It's sitting in the low branches of a tree, and about head height. I stop moving the flashlight and keep the beam on the bird for a moment. The bird opens its mouth and makes the fake crashing sound. Oh, and the little guy stuck around for another month, making the same sound so I eventually got used to his sound at night as well. But I resented it every time I heard it. Every year we take a three-day family canoe trip in central Pennsylvania. I was around 16 and brought some friends along for our journey. This is a pretty remote area with very limited cell phone reception and not many permanent residents. We take all of our gear with us in four canoes and just find a clearing for us to camp. The water level was low that year, so it was slow going. The first day we relaxed and didn't paddle much, found a clearing and made camp. On the second day we had to make up some time, so we paddled until dusk. It was getting late and we were in a part of the river with mountains on both sides. There was a small path leading up between some pine trees and a small patch of sand that we could beach our canoes. We started unloading our supplies and set out to see how much room there is for our campsite. Not ten feet! into the pine trees. I see three tents torn to shreds, coolers strung out everywhere, clothing pieces half buried in the dirt. There isn't any way in or out from that campsite except the river. It was too late for us to look for a new spot, so we ended up staying there. That night every sound I heard was going to murder me. I could hear rustling leaves coming closer to the campsite, then a loud crack from a log breaking. Our dog started growling and took off running after something. We could hear whatever he was chasing making its way up the mountain. Our dog returned a few minutes later, thankfully. Woke up early after barely sleeping and got the hell out of there. When I was back and packing in the Sierras two summers ago, I had set up camp at this beautiful spot I came across and spent the night there. Well, since the campsite offered such a nice view, I decided to stay there an extra night. About an hour after sunset, I got into my tent and started to fall asleep. In the middle of the night, 
I heard distinct footsteps nearby and I immediately thought it was a bear or a mountain lion. Humans were mostly out of the option because I was three weeks into my trip and had only seen a couple of clamors twenty-five miles down the trail. The footsteps stopped, but the hairs on the back of my neck were raised like never before. I could feel something outside my tent. I had my ice axe gripped in my hand and stayed still, waiting for more noise all night. I woke up the next morning, still gripping my axe, and unzipped my tent. And in the middle of the fire ring I made was an empty handle of Josie Hewerbo sitting in a pile of ashes. There were no footprints around and never heard or saw anyone for the next three days. Thanks for listening, cowboys and cowgirls. Hope you enjoyed these stories. Tomorrow we dive deep into horror of American countryside. See you then.